Greetings CATVC, it's Lisa here, Executive Director, and I'm joined with two guests today who I'll tell you more about in just a moment. It is a busy time, grade reports being written, admission season starting, and COVID. You're continuing to stretch in ways you never imagined or thought you could. Halloween is coming, the election just after that, there's a lot on our minds and our hearts. So Thanksgiving will hopefully provide us with a needed break, a chance to give thanks, collect ourselves, and nurture our closest relationships. Just before that break, and to get you well set up for it, CATDC is hosting a very special event with Dr. Dan Siegel, renowned neurobiologist, visionary, and pioneer in the field of mental health, author of The Developing Mind, Mindset, and Brainstorm, to name just a few of his many books. And to provide you with an opportunity to learn more about Dr. Siegel in this event, I've invited, I've invited him to be here with us today. I'm very excited, as you can tell, along with Nakia Young, who facilitates CATDC's ongoing cohort, Cultivating Resilience and Attunement on the Path to Racial Integrity. And Nakia has been very deeply influenced by Dr. Siegel's work. So I thought it'd be great to have the two of them um, present today to talk about the, his presentation and more. So Nakia, in addition to being a facilitator with CATDC and director of counseling at Lick Wormerding High School in San Francisco, you've worked as a kindergarten teacher, first and second grade teacher, been a lower middle school counselor, and also a charter school administrator. Tell us about your connection to Dan's work. How has it influenced you? Okay, well, in so many ways, um, I'm gonna tell a story. Um, so I actually was introduced to Dan's work at the tail end of my own adolescence. So I was an adolescent of voting age, but an adolescent nonetheless. <sighs> and um, my therapist at the time was bringing some of Dan's concepts into our conversations. And I wanted to talk about it so much that he eventually got exasperated and just gave me his home study tapes. <laughs> um, so I listened to, um, what was it? Interpersonal neurobiology and the developing mind, those mm. three cassettes over and over and over and over again. And I would say that um, one of Dan's gifts to the world, and I would say to me is really an expanded sense of what's possible in the world. Um, I mean, there are so many ideas that um, resonated with me so deeply. The idea that um, I could use my mind and my behavior to change my brain, that groups of people working together can use their minds and their behavior and resonance to change their brains, which then changes culture and community. Like all of those things resonated with me so, so deeply. Um, and keep in mind, this is many years before a brainstorm um, but I remember in those tapes, Dan talking about the, the precious gift that adolescents um, bring, which is that of innovation, which makes cultural evolution possible in a different way. And the example was like, if everyone is weaving from top to bottom, um, the, the adolescent might weave from bottom to top and something new and exciting might come from that. So that that message left me feeling so seen and valued um that that place of innovation was my developmental stage but it's also kind of my personality um and so it 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 just gave me a feeling of um i don't know engagement so as a layperson um, I was co-facilitating some groups for adults who were healing from unresolved trauma and loss in childhood. And it was a group that was middle-aged, middle-class, white, cisgender, heterosexual, almost exclusively. And um, it wasn't that other people weren't showing up, it was that they weren't staying. And for me, what I was hearing in those tapes that I was listening to over and over again really showed a way forward. So um, I ended up restructuring that meeting and um, contacting the company that put out those tapes for a, for a donation to start a lending library so all the participants listened to Dan's work. And then we went through a consensus process together where we restructured the meeting 
in harmony with the idea of the narrative of the other. So like, I keep you in mind even when we're not together or the, the, the emergent resonant ISO, the internal state of the other. You feel me, I feel you, you feel me, I feel you. And we really worked together to, to, to have everyone really like change their brains and heal. The group, it blew up in that good way. Like when, when a text thread is blowing up your phone. Um, so like the folks who came through stayed and it, it, it really provided a way for me to create um, an inclusive healing space uh, that really worked. And so I have brought Dan's work to really everything <laughs> I've done professionally. I was just ending college. Um, so this was before my teaching program, before my doctorate. So for me, Dan's work is baked in. I could talk forever. <laughs> I'll stop there. <laughs> Thank you, Nikia. I've learned so much from you about your work, Dan. And I wonder um, how Dan Nakia's perspective resonates with what you've heard from other educators. Well, first of all, it's an honor to be here with you both and with everyone listening. Thank you for taking the time to, to connect. And to begin with, with Nakia, thank you for those beautiful, beautiful words. You know, it's... Um, sometimes lonely writing, you know, this is my home office where I've written every book that I've written right, right here. And, um, you know, you're there for hours and hours reading all the books to prepare and reading all the papers and thinking about how to do it and making first drafts and second drafts and 20th drafts and editing, you know, getting in, then finally getting feedback and then changing things after that. So it takes a lot of time and it can be very solitary so to have the relational connection with you, Nikia, and hearing the experience makes it all worthwhile. So thank you very much for, for articulating those things. I, you know, I can say that the journey with educators has been like that, Lisa, in terms of your question of you know, other educators, where you know, maybe it's because all my relatives were teachers and my mom also started out teaching um, uh, in, um, in her case, it was in, in junior high school. Uh, my cousin was a teacher in kindergarten and first grade. And then I had an uncle who was a teacher in high school English. And my mom went on to become a counselor and then finally a vice principal at my high school after I left, fortunately. Um, so <laughs> I guess, you know, educators are totally in my family. And I always felt that there was nothing more important than trying to educate the next generation. And so as a physician starting in pediatrics and then moving to psychiatry and child and adolescent psychiatry, you know, you work with one person at a time or one family at a time when that kind of opened up to become like a, more like an educator for people in the mental health field. And then there were opportunities to actually teach educators. It really felt exciting because these ideas from this framework of interpersonal neurobiology that Nikki is referring to, you know, is the idea that what if you put together all the different disciplines of science into one framework and, you know, walked your way through each of them, just like I'm on this walking desk right now during the pandemic, so I don't lose my mind. I can actually be embodied while I connect and teach and even write on this walking desk. Um, you know, when you walk your way through all the different sciences, and find the common ground. E.O. Wilson has a term, consilience. Mm -hmm. So that's the common ground. And so when you do that, and the developing mind, I think is, you know, the textbook, if you say, well, where's all the science of that? That would be the kind of the, the, the mothership, if you will, of all these ideas. And the third edition in 2020 is out. And um, you'll see this deep, deep, deep dive into questions that educators, you know, face every day, like, what is the mind that you're trying to educate? Yes. Um, how does the body have to do with the mind? And has that all relate to our connections with each other? What does that have to do with our communities? How does that have to do with consciousness? What can you do to know the difference between the mind and the brain, things like that? So when you dive into it, what's so exciting about it is exactly what Nikia you're saying is you, you start shifting how you perceive what you're doing and then in your own personalized way 
you can incorporate the material into your own approach to curriculum, you know? So, you know, we have a school, for example, New Road School headed by Lutheran Williams, where the whole school is being organized around interpersonal neurobiology and the central tenets of that approach. And, you know, in working with him, in, in thinking about these deeply, he's then applied it in his own unique way as a headmaster, but I teach all the K through 12 teachers about the approach and then they apply it in their own unique way. And so every school would do it uniquely. There's a school in New York, which did the same thing. It's K through eight. And um, so, yeah, so it's ex really exciting. And I feel like I'm coming back home, back to you know basic education for the next generation. Oh, that's wonderful. And that's so great to hear about the new school. I didn't even realize that was taking place. So I'm excited to learn more about that. Um, and what can you say about the relevance of this particular presentation you'll be doing with the CATDC community, um, we and our interconnected reality? Yeah, well, that's exactly the issue, you know, is I think um, the pandemic is an invitation in the terrible disruption it's been where people are losing their lives, losing their livelihoods with people who've been marginalized, people of color in the United States are, are more devastated by this terrible pandemic that's happening. Um, and in the disruption, we can ask the question, you know, is this just gonna be a trauma that's affected our communities in different ways, but affected everyone? Or instead of just being a trauma, can it be actually a disruption in the way things have been to really rethink how things could be? So Nikki was mentioning brainstorm, you know, this idea of using creative exploration to not just take in the world as it is, but imagine how the world should be. And then, you know, how do we work together? So we is a funny term that combines the notion that students can have an internal sense of identity as a me. And what we need to do is expand that identity that in the United States, anthropologists consider the most individualistic culture in the world to say, it, you're too differentiated in the United States that we need to be more integrated. Integration will be, yes, you're differentiated, but you also have a relational self, a self that's in connection with your teacher, with your peers, with your family, with your community, with the whole city, with the state, with the nation, with the whole world of human beings, and then with the whole relational world of living beings on earth. And when you think of that as the relational self, let's just use the simple word we, W-E, as that larger relational self, then an integrated identity that we do not have right now, but that we could have, that I think indigenous teachings have taught forever, in certain ways, would be me plus we equals we, you know, where you're not losing the separate things. And so we have a we have a we community that's growing. The school New Roads is based on this idea of we. And the reality of interconnection is that you could argue that many of the problems of chaos and rigidity we see in the world is due to impaired integration at every level of integration. So one of them is, let's say, let's talk about systemic racism. You know, people have excessively differentiated in what Isabel Wilkerson has called out as a, a caste system. Uh, and when you look deeply at that scholarly work by Wilkerson, you really see how racism is actually a part of a structural in-group, out-group prioritization that we don't need to live by anymore. And then in fact, when you look at a, 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 another scholarly work called the spirit level, when societies live with this disparity, uh, the higher the disparity, the more the illness in everyone in the society. So it's really a matter, uh, as Dr. Sarah King says, you know, to think of the science of social justice is identical to the science of well-being. Yes. And, and um, so that's one part of it. If you look at planetary issues, we've excessively disconnected from nature and that excessive differentiation has thrown the balance of integration off. So the chaos and rigidity, not just with social injustice, but with environmental destruction is also from this you know, problem by, of identity. 
when I go around to schools and I feel what my colleagues, Peter Senge and Metabol and Otto Scharmer call a relational field. And we're trying to study this thing called generative social fields. A generative social field, like in a classroom, as you can feel a teacher has created this collaborative, cooperative, creative, compassionate classroom. So we're trying to figure out, you know, we found seven teachers that the school administrators and the other teachers know is happening. We brought the teachers together for an intensive think tank. And we said to them, everyone knows you're doing it. Okay, thank you, thank you. What are you doing? And this is what they all said. I have no idea. <laughs> so we took, we had a film crew to go in to film it and we're trying to study what are they doing? I have a theory about it, but we haven't analyzed the data yet. Right. The theory is that they create integration in the classroom. Mm -hmm. And what we're trying to do at New Roads and what we've done at the Blue School in New York, in New York City you know, is try to create generative fields within classrooms, within the larger study areas that are in the school curriculum, and then within the whole school. Um, and when you start thinking in a systems terms like that, or as Peter says, Peter Senge says, you know, system sensing, and Otto Scharmer talks in this way too, you know, you can show your, I think, this is now my view, not theirs, but my view is that the teacher or the administrator is creating integration within the relational worlds that exist within the school. And then you, then this is why working with Lathurin is so much fun, Lathurin Williams, because, you know, we take the science of interpersonal neurobiology and then with his visionary work, apply it K through 12. And then you can see not just in a school, but up in Canada, we were doing some stuff in a school district, you know, where you said, you can say, well, how do you reorient a whole school? So it isn't just about acquiring factual knowledge. It's really about encouraging integrative relationships. And we would be just the fun, simple summary of everything I just said. <laughs> because if a, if a student learns, and at New and the Blue School, when I gave the, um, I gave the first, uh, whatever it's called, when they, what is it called, the, the speech when kids are graduating, um, commencement. The commencement address. Yeah. So I gave this commencement address, right? It's in New York. So they picked a hall where both, um, you know, President Barack Obama had spoken and Abraham Lincoln had spoken. And I'm on this, I'm on this like stage where these two, you know, you know, heroes uh, had spoken and the kids are down there. So I jump off the stage and I said, it may be a little intimidating to think that, you know, Lincoln was here and Obama was here. Um, but I'm gonna get down to your level because you could be up there one day. And this is all about you realizing you're not just a me, you're also a we, but you're both, you're we. And what the parents wrote me back at the end of the summer, that summer, they said all the kids would be texting each other with, we wants to do this and we wants to do that. <laughs> it was hilarious. So anyway, you can have a lot of fun doing it. And, you know, the idea is to do the work through this pandemic, you know, help kids develop individual resilience, use the disruption of the pandemic as an opportunity to reconfigure how we're going about our business as usual, so that instead of just doing the usual usual, we say, okay, things are disrupted, but this is an opportunity through the disruption to reorganize the systems of doing things and a simple way to remember it is with this notion of integration, that you want to honor differences, promote linkages. And we, we, when we go to schools, when I go to schools and ask kids, how are you doing? When there isn't a generative field in the school, the kids never use the B word. They never use belonging. And when there's a positive energy in a school, they always use the belong. I belong here. And so we're really looking for integration as being the field that invites collaboration, connection, acceptance, not only tolerating differences, but thriving because of differences. And then no matter who you are and all the different ways we can differentiate ourselves, um, you belong. <laughs> That's it. Yes. And then to have a lot of gratitude. There's my gratitude. Okay. Gratitude cup is always good to have on your desk. Um, well, Nikia and I have talked a lot, Dan, about how generative your work is. Mm -hmm. And Nikia, can you just talk about the way it's influenced 
your work with CATBC and beyond around social justice and equity? Yeah. Well, I mean, it's 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 interesting, and this is one of the things that I love about hearing Dan talk is just like there's so many ideas, <laughs> and you you know you, you travel from here to Idaho to New Mexico and then back, and and like it all is coherent and and it makes sense. And I think that um, in what we just heard, Dan did speak to it, and really that idea that um, that integration is health um is is core is core for me and so i think that i mean so there's this there's this really beautiful quote um of dan's that says the the ultimate expression of integration is awareness kindness compassion and love and um that makes so much sense to me and it really fits and there's a, a little something about it that that is paradoxical, which is that I, I think that for us and perhaps in this kind of intense differentiation and this kind of like toxic racial differentiation thing that we have going on here, um, that equity and our relationships to power and oppression are a disintegrated um, and like dissociated away element. So one of the things that that I really focus on is is using this um, this MUI approach and creating this this field or this I mean I would say it you know like this inclusive healing space like the one that I described before that utilizes these um, ideas that Dan has shared that have been so so meaningful to so many parents and so many of their children so like using these really good parenting skills Right, we have this firm and loving presence, but there are limits. Um, rupture and repair are part of the model. So I think part of the question for me is, how do we, like in our in our parenting of ourselves, and um, in our desire for a true integration and for a more equitable loving, kind, compassionate society, how do we work together? How do we use our minds and our behavior to change our brains in the direction of racial health? There are, so there are a lot of like big, scary things that people need to face in community with one another. And so a, a huge part of my focus is creating an environment in which people have the um, find the internal resilience, but also the resilience that comes with community trust and mutual investment, uh, common purpose to really um, move from the place of dissociation, fighting, running, the rigidity, the chaos. Dan, I use the river of integration in my work. <laughs> um, but to, to really use that to, to face those things that we so desperately need and really want to integrate so that we can live more, more fully, happily, lovingly, and peacefully with one another internally and externally. Yeah, that's so beautiful, Nikia. And I think that, that if you just soak in those words, when you see them actually in practice, it's, uh, it's just a joy. And it, it really is this, um, it, it's almost like uh, maybe turning the usual thoughts about um, education, turning it quite a bit, because what we're saying is begin from the inside out, begin with relationships uh, that go in the inside and cultivate this sense of belonging and well being, where integration made visible is kindness and compassion. And then the learning will follow because curiosity um, will flourish when kids feel like they can be fully present in their authentic way of being. Mm -hmm. And at least when I went to school and when I've been to many schools, uh, that was not the case. And that uh, sadly, I don't think is the case that schools are really you know, focused on how to disseminate facts, 
how to disseminate certain skills that are understandable. You know, and the way I try to remember this is those basic skills of reading, writing, arithmetic are, they're really important. But the other three foundations, you know, of the capacity for reflection to go inward, the capacity for relationships that are mutually rewarding, that basically are integrative, and the capacity to build resilience, those three R's, those are really what I think educators need to have in the front of their minds um, so that when they do the work, the reading, writing, arithmetic flows out of those R's, mm -hmm. right? Because kids are gonna wanna read. They're gonna wanna figure out things with math, right? They're gonna wanna write things down and share with other people when they belong. And sadly, I think the, the loneliness people are experiencing these days, children, adolescents, adults, the depression, the anxiety, the suicide rates, the drug abuse, you know, the opposite of addiction is belonging, right? And so this is, even if you, if you do the classic study with rats, where you give them an option of water or cocaine, right? And they choose cocaine because it's addictive, right? Well, if you take the different paradigm, that's a rat alone in a cage. You take a rat with other rats that he's playing with, because he's a social creature, and you give him a choice between cocaine and water, maybe he'll try the cocaine a couple of times, and then he goes for the water because he belongs to a community, mm -hmm. right? He's not isolated. So sure, you're isolated, you, you're drawn to all these difficulties, you know, depression, anxiety. So th this is really, it's, it's really a comprehensive science-based yeah. approach to transforming certainly what we do in, in mental health. And I think the field of mental health and the field of education ought to be the same thing. Beautiful, beautifully said. And I think that's a wonderful place for us to close this particular conversation, but there are more conversations to come. Uh, you know, at CD, CITBC, building the sense of belonging among adults um, in order for them to bring that to their students is really key. Uh, relationships are at the heart of our work. And I really so much appreciate you both taking the time today to talk about this and also the work you do to foster that belonging and love and kindness and compassion um, and social activism in the world beyond. Um, so thank you so much um, for the CATDC community. I hope you'll come on November 18th to hear more, uh, to take time to pause, reflect, uh, connect, consider new resonances, and also to join others to engage in conversations. Um, Nakia will be there, we hope, to facilitate a breakout room at the end of Dr. Steele's presentation. So um, thank you again, both of you, for coming today and sharing your thoughts and your wisdom. This is such a pleasure. And if I can just encourage folks to come, I will say in 2014, I threw two educator friends in the car with me and drove from San Francisco to Los Angeles to see Dan. You oh. can do it online, make it happen while it's easy. <laughs> you will leave inspired. Thank right. you. Thank you, Nikia, so much. That's such a great story. And thank you for being here. And thank you, Lisa. And thank you both for all your wonderful work. All I right. look forward to seeing you on the 18th. Okay. Take care, everyone.